This interview is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program, Living Legends Collection. This interview was originally conducted on May the 20th, 1970. The interview was conducted by Mr. Pendleton Woods. The interviewee is Mr. William J. Otgen, that's O-T-J-E-N, of Enid, Oklahoma. This interview is being re-recorded on November the 30th, 1984, for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. Uh, this is Penn Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. The date is May 20th, 1970. I'm in Enid, Oklahoma, and we're interviewing Mr. W.J. Otgen. Is that correctly pronounced? O-T-J-E-N. Uh, what is W.J.? William. William J. Otgen. Uh, Mr. Otgen, to begin with, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, family background, where you were born, and uh, your parentage? Well, I was born in Kansas <coughs> on a farm a few miles outside of Parsons, Kansas. But I have no remembrance about that. My parents moved back to Ohio and my rearing from boyhood on was in Woodville, Ohio, and then just outside of Toledo, Ohio, where my father had a farm and had one clear up to the time that I came to Oklahoma. I came to Oklahoma in 1905. At the time, I had just graduated from the Northwestern University Law School in Evans, Illinois, and had intended to go back to Toledo, Ohio to practice. But I had worked constantly during the three years that I studied law, and as a result, I didn't have the length of study required by the Ohio Bar Commission. I came to Oklahoma expecting to practice as a lawyer for one year in Oklahoma, which would make me eligible for the bar examination in Ohio. And my thought was to spend a year here, practice here, and then go back for a bar examination in Ohio and to practice in Ohio. So I came here in September of 1905. And at that time, I came from Oklahoma City on the Rock Island train, walked uptown, and one of the ceremonies is all for celebrating the opening of the Cherokee Strip. Horsemen were tied or had their horses tied around the square, it was windy, dusty, and looked quite western, especially to one coming from Ohio. However, a man who had been in law school with me, Charles E. Richardson, had preceded me in Enid, and with a sign of Richardson and Ochen attorneys, he had attracted a pretty good client, and he asked me to hurry up and get here, for the, other, the client wanted to see me. That client was a lady who had considerable property in this vicinity. She was my client for years and years afterward. After I had practiced in Oklahoma for a year, I had quite a little business, nothing like the lawyers and Enid make now, but quite a little for that short period. And I thought I'd postpone the return to Ohio, and I've been returning it ever, postponing it ever since. At the time that I arrived here, I only knew two people I needed. One was this lawyer, Charles Richardson. The other was Winfield Scott, who I'd met in the university and who practiced here 
for many years, but became Commissioner of Pensions during the Coolidge administration. And he and I were partners for several years. When he became county judge, I first practiced by myself, then became associated with Robertson Curran, a leading firm here, then West Scott and Auction, and Charles West, one of the partners, became Attorney General of Oklahoma. Winfield Scott became County Judge of Garfield County, and I kept on in the practice in Enid. Paragraph. In my this getting acquainted in Enid, I went from one church to another on Sundays just to get acquainted with the people around here. And I found very good churches here, Methodist. And when I went there, I saw our then county judge, James B. Cullison, who was with his oldest daughter, June Cullison. And I met June in that church. And after a year or so, we were married and were living together since. Have had four children, now grown, two of them in Enid. One my son, William J. Ochen, Jr., and Mrs. Mary Barnes, B-A-R-N-S, who lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana for many years until her husband passed away. Then she returned to Enid. When I came to Enid, they had just been discussing selling the school land, and they sold what was called the school land in 1907. I bought one of those farms about east of Enid. It is now part of our Woodring Airfield. I sold half of it to the airfield and sold the other half later on. But I still have one of the farms acquired there, just east of that airfield out at Enid. We recently had a test for oil completed there. I am hopeful, but don't know just what will develop. As for myself, I served as city attorney of Enid for two years. During the service of Governor Haskell in Oklahoma, I was appointed assistant attorney general, took charge specifically of a grand jury at Watonga, traveled back and forth by train from Enid to Watonga during the period I was conducting my work there. I have seen any develop from a very ordinary western city into the busty, bustling, active place that it is today. In 1922, I was elected to the Oklahoma House of Representatives and served two years there. and then was elected to the Oklahoma State Senate and served eight years in the Oklahoma State Senate. During my period in the Senate, the Oklahoma flag was presented to me as the senator from the district representing Garfield County and I introduced the act establishing this flag as a flag of Oklahoma, urged its passage, and it was passed and is now our state flag. Oh, 
Later on, in 1942, I was nominated by the Republicans as a candidate for governor of Oklahoma. My opponent was Robert S. Kerr, and the election was rather close. However, the election was in favor of Robert Kerr, and he served four years as governor of Oklahoma and then went on to be the distinguished senator from Oklahoma. I was very closely acquainted with Senator Kerr, clear up to the time of his death, and we continued on very friendly terms. I also was the Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate and served and ran for the U.S. Senate in 1942 at the time that Dewey was making his race against President Truman. Before I came to Oklahoma, and leaving that farm back in Toledo, Ohio, I enlisted <clears throat> at just the close of what was called the Spanish War. There were 10 regiments raised for service in the Philippine Islands, and I went from Toledo, Ohio, to Fort Ethan Allen, Vermont, enlisted in the 43rd United States Volunteer Infantry. We sailed from New York after a training period at Fort Ethan Allen, Vermont, sailed through the Atlantic, Mediterranean, and Suez Canal, stopping at Singapore and on to the Philippines. I served for nearly two years in the Philippine Islands, all of this occurring before I came to Oklahoma. During my period in the Oklahoma Senate, I was elected commander-in-chief of the United Spanish War Veterans, which had a membership then which was quite large. There was then about 450,000 of us. Now there is only about 5,000 or so left. I have been active in Enid, have enjoyed its wonderful growth, and my wife and children think it is one of the finest cities they have ever seen, and they like it as a place of residence and are much taken with it and are very happy and are delighted with the growth of Enid and the development of Enid, this county, and the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Mr. Ogden, uh, you uh, spoke of your early service in the uh, legislature. I wondered if uh, you could, was that 1922? About. Uh, why don't you tell us what uh, were the principal uh, points of debate and legislation at that time? About that time we started hard surface roads in Oklahoma and it was a beginning under the State Highway Commission. There was much legislation affecting the highways, and during that two-year period, Jack Walton was elected governor at the same time I was elected to the, Sen uh, to the House of Representatives. There was considerable controversy developed between 
the members of the legislature and the governor, and it resulted in impeachment charges being filed against the governor. I participated in the impeachment proceedings as one of the members of the board in charge thereof, and the impeachment resulted in the removal of Governor Walton and Edwin Trapp, then Lieutenant Governor, became Governor. Trapp became very active in the hard surface roads of Oklahoma, and during the rest of the term, in the next two years, at that time I had become a member of the Oklahoma Senate. He during the last two years of his administration, the first road systems in Oklahoma were completed, and Prince Gentry was a member of the Highway Commission, the Oklahoma Highway Commission, from Enid, Oklahoma at that time. Later on, after Mr. Gentry passed away, Burt Parker of Enid became Highway Commissioner and represented Enid for the rest of my term in the State Senate of Oklahoma. I had been a member with Mr. Frank Carter, and he and I have been practicing in Enid for about 30 years, during which time Mr. Carter became mayor of the city of Enid and served two years in that position. He is still in very active practice in Oklahoma. I have continued to maintain an office for the practice of law clear until now and am in the office nearly every day at the present time, and still enjoy being active with the lawyers of Oklahoma. I wonder, I'm going to turn the tape over, and we continue this tape on the other side. Mr. Ogden, uh, you have campaigned actually during uh, several periods of time. I know during the early 1920s when you ran for the legislature and Senate, and then uh, later, I believe, running for the United States Senator and later for governor, isn't this correct? Uh, I wondered if you would uh, talk about these various campaigns, uh, both from your personal standpoint and from the standpoint of, uh, of campaigns generally, the diff some of your personal experiences plus uh, uh, some of the general differences that you have in a campaign during the periods that you were running. I think television has made a tremendous difference in the situation. When I ran for representative and for the state senate, we were wholly dependent on newspaper ads, radio talks, and what public meetings we could have. And when I ran for governor in 42, it was during the war period, and it was hard to get tires for cars, and the radio was our only means of getting statewide communication. Also, at the time I ran for the U.S. Senate, we had nine candidates in the Republican primary, and I was nominated in the first primary without what we call the runoff. The entrance of television made a tremendous difference in Oklahoma, and I think it has been of great importance 
in the development of an active Republican Party in Oklahoma and the making of Oklahoma a two-party state as it is recognized today. Television didn't become much of a factor in the races until after my races had been completed. But I think it has been a very strong factor in the election since that time. Mr. Ogden, over the over the years, Mr. Ogden, I know that you have uh, been acquainted with and have worked closely with a number of people prominent in politics. Um, I would like to have some of your comments, uh, or recollections, and if you know any stories or anecdotes or experiences involving any of these people that might give us some sort of an insight into their personality, either their political or personal personality, uh, uh, I'd like for you to do so. We might start back with the very earliest people that you may have been in contact with, such as uh, Dennis Flynn and some of the, uh, maybe Robert Owen if you knew him, others in the very earliest period. One of the early campaigns of Oklahoma was the time that at the time of the Harding campaign in Oklahoma, I was very closely associated with Frank Parkinson of Enid who was a Ford automobile dealer in Enid and Lawton. Parkinson was state chairman, had me down to Oklahoma City at various times in there. And I remember the speech of uh, Harding in Oklahoma City. At that speech, there were there had been a bitter campaign in the primary. At the time of the campaign, John McGraw, a Tulsa banker, was national committeeman. Jake Hammond. Jake Hammond of Ardmore entered the campaign against him. I knew Hammond well. In fact, I visited with him in Oklahoma City frequently where he was in there on pol political campaigns and during that summer, Hammond, in his candidacy for state committeeman, ran against McGraw. There was a bitter campaign in Oklahoma, but it resulted in Hammond winning. And as soon as he was in that position, he backed Leonard Wood of Illinois as his candidate for the Republican nomination. The Republican delegation was largely influenced by Hammond. However, Wood aligned himself with the McGraw faction and disclaimed the Hammond support. And Hammond then became active, and he controlled the Oklahoma delegation and also delegates from Kansas and Oklahoma. And in the Chicago Convention, Hammond, we Oklahomans were told, and in fact some of the delegates there, 
saw Hammond write a check for $25,000 to pay Harding's expenses and bring, enable him to keep up his campaign for president. Anyway, Harding was nominated for president in Chicago and in gratitude to Hammond, came to Oklahoma City, made a speech there, and I was present at that speech. I heard Hammond at that time say, I expect to do something for this good man, and he placed his hand on Hammond's shoulder. I was closely in touch with Hammond and very much interested in it, but at that time he was shot by his secretary and in lived for several days afterward, but passed away before Harding was ever installed as president. During the time that time I was in, it was before I had even gone to the legislature, but Harry Glasser was our senator from Oklahoma, from Garfield County, and the, gov the governor Trapp, who had gone, who was then lieutenant governor, went on what was called the governor's train. They invited me to go with them, and Harry Glasser and I, together with the adjutant general of Oklahoma, Baird Markham, assistant attorney general, and quite a delegation, Wallace, who afterward became federal judge, we went on a special train to Mexico City, and while we were on that trip, the shooting of Hammond occurred and he passed away before we returned from that trip to Oklahoma City. I was closely associated with Alexander, A.C. Alexander, who was Republican chairman for a number of years, Big Jim Harris of Wagoner, who was an active Republican leader, Bill Skelly of the Skelly Oil Company was a Spanish War veteran, more or less interested with us Spanish War veterans at that time, and there were quite a number. When Teddy Roosevelt became president, he made Frank France, who was also a rough writer, postmaster at Enid, and later on made him governor of the territory of Oklahoma. Frank France, of course, came from Enid, and I was in charge of the Spanish War veterans in Enid, and we installed Frank France as a member of our Spanish War veterans camp here in Enid. Charlie West, who later became Attorney General of Oklahoma, was also there, was also a member. Charlie Hunter, who was clerk of the federal courts of the territory of Oklahoma by appointment of Teddy Roosevelt, was also with us there. And Charles Crager of Muscogee, a Spanish War veteran, was elected to uh, the Congress during the Harding landslide. And Crager served for two years there. He passed away about four or five years ago. The Spanish War veterans in Oklahoma became quite an active crew. One of them was federal judge of the Eastern District. And they were deputy U.S. Marshals and had quite a number of appointments. But in our later years, Lou Wentz became national committeeman 
and largely influenced the Republican politics in Oklahoma. I was quite active with Lou, and he was Republican National Committeeman from Oklahoma during the time that I was running for governor and also for the U.S. Senate. Lou Wentz was active as chairman clear up to the time of his death. And I think the work of the man like Frank Parkinson I think the work of the man like Frank Parkinson, Lou Wentz, Jim Harris, A.C. Alexander, Raymond Fields, and Wirt Franklin. Wirt Franklin, Harry Glasser, Yes. Also, when I first came to Oklahoma, Governor Ferguson was governor of the territory, and he was succeeded, as I recall, by Frank France. and France served until Haskell was elected at statehood. I was in the Oklahoma National Guard and at the installation, our local Enid company went from Enid to Guthrie and participated, marched at, during the parade when Haskell was installed as governor of Oklahoma. Haskell's administration was a difficult one in that was the first governor over statehood and there was a statehood election and as we all know now, Haskell ascertained that Oklahoma City had won the election as capital of Oklahoma, and he and the Secretary of State simply removed the seal from Guthrie and moved to Oklahoma City and declared the Huckins Hotel as a seat of government in Oklahoma City, for we had no state capital or anything at that time. Haskell had to really mold the state government because in the territory, of course, the territory of Oklahoma was simply the western part of Oklahoma, and taking on the Indian Territory portion, we had much more of a territory to look after and a great change in the government. As I recall, when Frank France was governor, W. Cromwell of Enid was his attorney general, and the, there was just one attorney general. The attorney general didn't have the group of assistants that has developed in the later years. Charles West of Enid was elected attorney general in the first election went into office at the same time Haskell went in. And Charles West had been my partner in the practice in Enid, so I knew him well, and I was in his office frequently at the state capitol. They had to establish, 
new office arrangements in Oklahoma City build up a new government for the United States. And there were many questions which arose in that early statehood period. Steer questions of the power of state officials. I remember that Charles West was quite interested in a bank case in Oklahoma City, and he brought that case without the direction of the governor. And the governor ordered him to stop the continuance of it, and he repu West refused. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that the Attorney General could only proceed at the direction of the governor. And West had to seize this bank case in Oklahoma City. Senator, uh, during your career, I am sure you were well acquainted with uh, Bill Murray, the president of the Constitutional Convention, the first speaker of the House in Oklahoma, after Oklahoma statehood as a congressman and later as governor. Is that correct? That is correct. When I went to Oklahoma City, Bill Murray was retiring there as governor. I mean, Murray was still in. He succeeded Holloway when Holloway went in. And Murray regarded me as representative of the Champlain Oil Company and rather the representative wealth of Garfield County and was not very friendly. He thought I was, oppo I opposed some of his measures. But later on, we became quite friendly. And when I ran for governor, Murray openly endorsed me and put out a letter predicting that I would win, but he didn't. He took in too much territory on that. It was one of the closest elections we have had, but I didn't win that election. And there's 16,000 vote difference. Practically 16,000, a few votes over 16,015, as I remember. And in the early election, when just the men voted, John Fields ran for governor, and he came within four or 5,000 votes of winning. But it was that, we didn't have the women voting at that time, and the vote was much smaller. But that was the closest race that there had ever been prior to that race of mine. Senator, four years ahead. Wait about 30 days for the returns to keep John Fields from being elected. Didn't <laughs> yes, that's right. In the four years ahead of that, Ross Risley, a very strong candidate, was a Republican candidate for governor against Leon Phillips. And as I recall, the election resulted in 260,000 majority for Leon Phillips in that race, or that was a rough majority for the Democratic candidates. So when we were running with Kerr on the Democratic side, myself on the Republican, and we had no TV in those days, any of our speaking had to be done by radio, there was a tremendous difference in the campaigning between then and now. I feel that the race we made there at that time was very helpful in building up the Republican Party in Oklahoma, and it helped and grew steadily from then on. Were you acquainted with the territorial governor? I was very slightly acquainted with Governor Ferguson, but I was well acquainted with Governor France. They were, France was the last territorial governor. You were well acquainted with his son, Walter, of course. Oh, yes, very well acquainted. 
No, I wasn't acquainted with Governor Jenkins. Uh, could you talk about uh, Governor uh, Franz? Anything that you have not told us that you feel might be of interest to you? Rules of the president, the top of the hill with the flag. Well, the story we had in our Spanish War veteran circles, and I think it's true, France was not with the Oklahoma Rough Riders. He enlisted either in New Mexico or Arizona, and O'Neill was captain of France Company, and O'Neill was killed at San Juan Hill. The story that we had, and I think it's true, was that Roosevelt was riding up and down the line, and he saw Frank France, who had taken charge of his company. He was first lieutenant under O'Neill. And the Roosevelt said to France, where are you going, lieutenant? And he said, France's answer was, to the top of the hill, sir. And it impressed Roosevelt so much that he made France first postmaster and then governor of Oklahoma. But Roosevelt appointed many Spanish war veterans. Abernathy, remember the story there, why it was that Abernathy took Roosevelt on a wolf hunt down near Frederick. And Abernathy would how show them how to capture wolves by riding horseback, chasing the wolf, and jumping off when the wolf became worried and tearing its jaws apart. And Roosevelt was so impressed, they appointed Abernathy, Marshal of the Western District of Oklahoma, for that period as well. Were you acquainted with Dennis Flynn? Oh, very well, yes. Yeah. France, in those days, we had no autos to speak of at all, if we had any. And to go to Guthrie, between India and Guthrie, was quite a train trip, taking about three hours or so to go by rail. France at Guthrie didn't get to eat very much, but I would be in France's office with Cromwell, the Attorney General, and uh, would see France about every time I went to Guthrie, which would be frequently in that. France's governor. I knew France and saw him frequently, clear up to the time that he passed away. He was in Tulsa during the later years of his life. How about Robert Owen? The senator, yeah. I knew Owen from, from visits in Washington, but came more interested with him during the campaign when uh, Harding was running for election. The uh, Owen made Republican speeches, and I happened to be chairman of the Republican meeting in Enid, and the lady who was chairman of the YWCA women's christian temperance union for the state was also making speeches let's see that was during the al smith hoover campaign though i'm getting off my tracks here on that uh, what about uh, the senator from Governor Williams was a very good lawyer and became federal judge, of course, after he went out as governor. And I didn't see as much of Williams as I did of the other governors. I saw far more of him when he became justice of the Supreme Court and was 
quite friendly with him during the period that he was governor and also on the Supreme Court. Yes. He was a Democrat. Yes. Frank was a candidate for governor, and during his campaign, I saw him in Enid at various times, and saw him frequently in Oklahoma City, but had no business contacts with him. Was purely political. In the species that that were made during the Harding Cox campaign, it wasn't we didn't feel as confident of winning there as we really should have felt, because we didn't have the organization in the Republican Party that we have had in later years. But that result in Oklahoma resulted in some three congressmen being elected. Alice Robertson, of congressman from that district, and you spoke of and a story, as I heard her tell this one, which ought to be passable since she told it. She said she is riding on a Pullman train, and the man above her was snoring quite loudly. And so when he kept it up and she couldn't get to sleep, she rapped on the berth up above, and he stopped snoring. But before she could get to sleep, he resumed, started snoring again. And it continued until she had woke him up about three times. And since she did it the next time, he said, It's no use, lady. I heard you the first time. But I'm not that kind of a man. That. <laughs> <laughs> We had out to our house the president of the YMCA, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she talked to Mrs. Hodgson about going in the basement, pressing out some clothes or so, and Mrs. Hodgson told her to go ahead. And Mrs. Hodgson was dumbfounded when the colored girl told her that she said, Mamie, where's that, what's that odor there? And the colored girl said, why, that's Mary's home brew. Mary here was just about 10 or 11 years old at that time, and she bought a package of some brew she could manufacture a soft drink out of, and she had a big jar, and she'd put it to work in that, and that yeast had overflowed the jar, and that president of the WCTU went down there. Mrs. Hudson was horrified to find she had to smell that brew and see that big jar bubbling over there with it. <laughs> Mr. Hudson, we certainly appreciate very much the opportunity to visit with you on tape. It's very, very nice. Oh, I think you've got some good stories. the Republican Party in Oklahoma, and it helped and grew steadily from then on. Were you acquainted with the territorial government? I was very slightly acquainted with Governor Ferguson, but I was well acquainted with Governor France. They were France for the last territorial governor. 
Oh, yes. Very well acquainted. Governor Jenkins, were you acquainted with him? No, I wasn't acquainted with Governor Jenkins. Uh, could you talk about uh, Governor uh, Franz? Anything that you have not told us that you feel might be of interest to you? Well, the story we had in our Spanish War veteran circles, and I think it's true, France was not with the Oklahoma Rough Riders. He enlisted either in New Mexico or Arizona. And O'Neill was captain of France Company, and O'Neill was killed at San Juan Hill. The story that we had, and I think it's true, was that Roosevelt was riding up and down the line and he saw Frank France, who had taken charge of his company. He was first lieutenant under O'Neill. And the Roosevelt said to France, where are you going, lieutenant? And he said, France's answer was, to the top of the hill, sir. And it impressed Roosevelt so much that he made France first postmaster and then governor of Oklahoma. But Roosevelt appointed many Spanish war veterans. Abernathy, remember the story there, uh, was that Abernathy took Roosevelt on a wolf hunt down near Frederick. And Abernathy would how, show him how to capture wolves by riding horseback, chasing the wolf, and jumping off when the wolf became worried and tearing its jaws apart. And Roosevelt was so impressed, he appointed Abernathy Marshal of the Western District of Oklahoma for that period as well. Were you acquainted with Dennis Jones? Oh, very well, yeah. France, in those days, we had no autos to speak of at all, if we had any. And to go to Guthrie, between Indian and Guthrie, was quite a train trip, taking about three hours or so to go by rail. France at Guthrie didn't get to eat very much, but I would be in France's office with Cromwell, the Attorney General, and uh, would see France about every time I went to Guthrie, which would be frequently in that. France's governor. I knew France and saw him frequently clear up to the time that he passed away. He was in Tulsa during the later years of his life. How about Robert Owen? The senator. I knew Owen for, from visits in Washington, but came more interested with him during the campaign when uh, Harding was running for election. The uh, Owen made Republican speeches, and I happen to be chairman of the Republican meeting in Enid, and the lady who was chairman of the YWCA, Women's Christian Temperance Union for the state, was also making speeches. Let's see, that was during the Al Smith Hoover campaign, though. I'm getting off my tracks here on that. Uh, what about... Uh Governor Williams was a very good lawyer, 
and became federal judge, of course, after he went out as governor. And I didn't see as much of Williams as I did of the other governors. I saw far more of them when he became justice of the Supreme Court and was quite friendly with him during the period that he was governor and also on the Supreme Court. The Frank, Frank Buckham? Yes. Did you comment on him? I mean, he was active in the Democratic Party. He was a Democrat. A Democrat. Yeah. Frank was a candidate for governor, and during his campaign, I saw him in Indian at various times, and saw him frequently in Oklahoma City, but had no business contacts with him, was purely political. In the species that that were made during the Harding-Cox campaign. It wasn't we didn't feel as confident of winning there as we really should have felt because we didn't have the organization in the Republican Party that we have had in later years. But that result in Oklahoma resulted in some three congressmen being elected. Alice Robertson, a congressman from that district, and you spoke of and his stories, I heard her tell this one, which ought to be passable since she told it. She said she is riding on a Pullman train, and the man above her was snoring quite loudly. And so when he kept it up and she couldn't get to sleep, she rapped on the berth up above, and he stopped snoring. But before she could get to sleep, he resumed, started snoring again. And it continued until she had woke him up about three times. And then she did it the next time. He said, it's no use, lady. I heard you the first time. But I'm not that kind of a man. <laughs> <laughs> We had out to our house the president of the YMCA, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she talked to Mrs. Watson about going in the basement, pressing out some clothes or so, and Mrs. Watson told her to go ahead. And Mrs. Watson was dumbfounded when the colored girl told her that she said, Mamie, where's that, what's that odor there? And the colored girl said, why, that's Mary's home brew. Mary here was just about 10 or 11 years old at that time, and she bought a package of some brew she could manufacture a soft drink out of, and she had a big jar, and she'd put it to work in that, and that yeast had overflowed the jar, and that president of the WCCU went down there. Mrs. Watson was horrified to find she had to smell that brew and see that big jar bubbling over there with it. <laughs> Miss Watson, we certainly appreciate very much the opportunity to visit with you on tape. It was very, very nice. Oh, I think you've got some good stories. Yeah. <sighs>